Right. Well, great. Thank you very much for uh, coming and listening to this session. Um, I'm used to talking to sort of more uh, sort of technical groups. So I guess, you know, if I, if I end up sort of uh, going into areas which you don't understand, you know, just sort of look at me a little bit blankly and I'll try and sort of move in, in, in less sort of technical directions. Um, the title of my speech, of my talk today really is, is, I try to mix things up a bit. I'm talking about augmented reality and augmented people, or artificial reality and augmented people, because these are two interesting technologies that are coming up or that are in the space at the moment that we all need to be very much aware of, and indeed things that I'm working with on a daily basis. So, to sort of uh, set a bit of background, you know, Mercer is a company that works with what we call mixed reality, as a mixed reality technology and solutions company. And this is a term that people are using, that people talk about virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, XR, these are all sort of new terms that are coming up at the moment. But really, it's not about these technologies per se, it's about a whole lot of new tools. And, you know, when we're thinking about these technologies, what are we really doing? What we're really doing is we're building new tools for people to augment their abilities. So, um, if you have the right tools, this gives you, if you like, an evolutionary and competitive advantage. This is what we've been doing since the days of the caveman. Um, and it also allows us to do things that, you know, we just cannot do otherwise. So when we start thinking about digital technologies, that hasn't changed. These are still the same reasons that we use these technologies today. This is why we have tools. So the idea of a superhuman, if you like, is a human with interesting technologies at their fingertips. When we talk about augmented realities, again, what are we talking about there? Um, I mean, we've been doing augmenting our reality since cavemen put pictures on the walls. We've been trying to sort of create an artificial uh, representation, if you like, of things that are interesting to us, trying to make things look a little bit different. Um, compared to today, when you look at that, I think that's a picture from an IKEA catalogue. Um, where there's nothing natural in that, really, I suppose. But nevertheless, um, you know, we are still augmenting our realities in all sorts of interesting ways with furnishings and things we do. Technology, again, is, I guess, one of those sort of changes. You know, when I started with technology, when I started with... Oops. When I started with virtual reality, um, I was using an MS-DOS PC, and we were running uh, virtual reality in... Uh, uh, yeah, for people with brain injury and, and things like that. So and that was 25 years ago or so. So while a lot of people are talking about these as, ah, the most amazing, new, and astounding technologies, actually they've been around a while. And so what we're starting to see today is an evolution of technology. And, you know, today we've heard a lot about um, platforms, we've heard a lot about... Um, you know, I, uh, APIs and so on. There is something else that's happening as well, though. We're seeing a paradigm shift. And this is a paradigm shift from what we call the information age to the intelligence age. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, the intelligence age means that we have powerful, if you like, mind-enhancing tools. So it's not just about tools like hammers and so on, but other kinds of tools that increase our mental capabilities at our fingertips. And we have other non-physical ways to alter our realities. So when we look at waves of technology, we can see that you know, in the early days of the PC, uh, we had the computing age. It was amazing. You could, you could have a computer on your desk, and it could do amazing things. Uh, we could do virtual reality, for example. Um, then we came into the information age, and that was sort of you know, where the internet and mobile devices were really sort of prevalent. But now we're entering into a new phase, which is really the intelligence age, where virtuality, AR, MR, AI, blockchain, all those sort of buzzwords, you know, they are all going to drive what the next generation of technology is. This is the paradigm shift that we're seeing. And, you know, when we look at the Gartner hype cycle, if you're familiar with this, this is a wonderful way of describing technologies because every technology goes through these, these uh, sort of uh, phases of inflated expectation um, and uh, troughs of disillusionment and so on. When I started in virtual reality, you know, we, had, uh, we had the idea we we're going to change the entire world. 
and of course everybody was enthusiastic about it. Virtual reality now, as you can see there, is just coming up what, call, what we call the slope of enlightenment. But what's really interesting to me is where is augmentation fit across this graph? Anything to do with augmentation, which is essentially AI and or AR based, fits across almost every kind of technology that's coming through this pipeline. This means that this is going to be significant stuff for us moving forward. Everything you thought you understood about technology is changing. Now, this is frightening stuff. Um, yeah. So, what I'm going to talk about for the remaining time is really about uh, a couple of key features which I think are important. Obviously, there's so much we can talk about. I mean, these are, these are subjects of entire courses at university and so on, but emergence, I think, is one of the most interesting areas. Emergent systems. And what this means is this allows us to develop technologies which are comprised of small, simple parts which are able to react more to us, uh, they're more proactive rather than reactive. So in other words, we can expect the systems to understand us better rather than having to um, tell it to do the things we want it to do. So if we think of uh, the internet as like a, a library of books, okay, an immersion system is more like a brain. So all these small parts working together to create something which is very hard to tell what it could do just by looking at the individual parts. We're heading towards emergent systems that have and use intelligence. And I'm using intelligence in the meaning of the word that's been uh, you know, discussed a lot today. That is, you know, information, data, knowledge, if you like. But also, of course, um, intelligence, which is the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills, and to, if you like, think. And we will see systems like that. Um, now, when we think about emergence, it's kind of an interesting thing to sort of discuss. There are natural emergent systems. So, for example, a flock of birds. You know, if you look at an individual bird, hard to tell that it could form a flock. A shoal of fish, a snowflake, individual particles of water form these amazing patterns. An ant nest, be up. Even our own consciousness is a form of emergent system. So imagine that you know, if we are creating systems like this, if we are deliberately trying to create emergent technologies, and that is what is happening at the moment, um, then it's hard to know what it's actually going to be. So I have a definition here which may sort of help. Emergent system or emergent property can appear when a number of simple entities, agents, operate in an environment forming more complex behaviors as a collective. Now research in this field goes back many decades, so it's not a new thing. But, you know, we've got to ask ourselves, what could possibly go wrong? You know, uh, who knows where this could lead? And again, this is sort of the danger that we do have to be aware of. We are now in the process of creating systems we don't understand. Now, we talked, I've heard a lot about complexity, but, you know, the complexity of traditional systems, you can look into it, you can, you can delve down into it, you can figure out what's going on, you can follow the signals. When we're talking about artificial intelligence, you can't open up the box and see what's happening. It's a black box. It's closed. It's hard to see. You don't know how it makes its decisions. So again, these are things I don't have the answer necessarily today. This is more to sort of pose the questions and have people think about things. But we do have to be aware where this could be going. All right, so let's change tack a little bit and talk about augmentation or augmented reality. Um, Let's have a look at what we can do today. So augmented reality is, is a technique where you can use usually a mobile device, or in some cases, glasses. Uh, you can use locations and marker-based augmented realities, different types. Uh, there's um, language and voice. Look, so that's the kind of stuff that's actually possible today. So the first of those uh, was using a marker. The, the card, if you like, the scratchy, is something that the device was able to look at and see, ah, I've seen one of those, and then it puts the game on top of that. So gamification was an important part of that. And of course, you saw there in the video a really cool transaction going on as well because she won something, and that she was very happy about it. The second kind of augmented reality is where you're just somewhere, and something happens. So you can be looking out towards the, the ocean there, and you can see Tangaroa coming out of the ocean. Again, these are all possible today with this sort of connected, cloud-based platforms that we're seeing at the moment. We're seeing all sorts of things with new kinds of augmented reality glasses. So 
you've got industrial applications, you've got medical applications, you've got new kinds of technologies which are like large screen, what they call cave environments. So this is a fascinating space. This is really, you know, it's futuristic, but it's here today. And it's all part of, if you like, the new interface. The new uh, screen is not here, it's all around you. And of course, that means, therefore, that the way we transact, the way we interact with stuff, if you like, virtual and real, is in the real world, not just on the screen. If we consider then also what we, what's going to be possible in the next five to 10 years, that's when it gets really interesting. There's a whole lot of amazing technologies that are starting to come through. New wearable and what I call bearable, in other words, you can carry them with you, uh, technologies. Um, so down the bottom there in the middle, there's a, a little pair of glasses that look a little bit sort of geeky at this stage from a company called Magic Leap. Now Magic Leap is developing a, a type of technology which means that I can have glasses on which augments everything I see around me. This will be a game changer. And whether Magic Leap comes out first or, or other companies come out first with this particular technology, this will change how people interact with virtual stuff, if you like, games and so on. We're also going to see new volumetric displays. The uh, image there on, on, on the left is a haptics device where you can actually feel stuff in a virtual space. Again, this is going to really change how people interact with stuff. It's, it's fun for one thing, but of course it, it brings another whole level of realism. On the uh, right-hand side, there's a little clip out of a video called A Day Made of Glass from a company called Corning. And if, you, if you're ever sort of uh, uh, interested in sort of futuristic videos of, of, of where technology can go, I, I, I rec highly recommend that one. There, what you're seeing is how people can use augmented reality and communication to co achieve complex tasks, like in this case, two medical practitioners talking across the world around a patient and then using augmented reality to uh, look at the scans and see how that's actually uh, what's happening inside the brain. Again, these things, they seem, oh, wow, is that even possible? And the answer is, well, yes, it's kind of even possible today, it's just a whole lot of things that need to come together to make that sort of seamless and, and actually work. So, I mean, I don't think Skype's quite on that one, but anyway. Um, so, one of the big things there is, of course, is uh, automation and fast connectivity. Now, we assume that connectivity is going to be fast, and we assume it's going to be always on, and it will be. Um, it's just a wee way to go yet. And we'll, we'll see always on assistive intelligence. And again, you know, I've heard conversations today about privacy and so on. There's this interesting dichotomy between privacy and, of course, wanting to be able to uh, have help from my data, if you like. These are all issues that will have to be dealt with. What does this mean for transactions? Well, it's an interesting thing because where we're working, we're seeing what is called the growth of experience economies, where people are paying for stuff that's not real, it's virtual, within virtual spaces. Um, you know, if we've got co advanced, always-on, contextual augmented reality, then we're going to have the ability to do micro, macro and micro transactions don't require any physical point-of-sale machines or indeed anything like that. Just by being there, I am transacting. And then the question is, what are you transacting? It's not necessarily about payments of currency per se. It's exchanges of value. And that value may change depending on the moment and who's in that, who's in that space at the time. People are going to buy more and more virtual products. I could buy a virtual Louis Vuitton coat for my virtual cat or dog. And yeah, you say, say well, how is that going to happen? Well, it has happened. There's, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a technology called Second Life, which has been around for quite a long time. And people can go in there and they can buy and sell and trade all within a complete virtual environment, buying completely virtual things that don't really exist in the real world. So it's happening today, but what we're seeing there is going to come out of the uh, virtual spaces and into this virtual space, which is the world we live in today. Um, we're going to see more and more automatic transactions, and we've heard that sort of discussion uh, today in particular. Um, because, um, well, you know, where blockchain is going, not where it is today, but where it is potentially going, is very, very interesting. And of course, where artificial intelligence is going, not where it is today, but where it's going, is very, very interesting as well. And when these two come together, that's going to be an interesting sweet spot. Um, 
both of those technologies have a lot of growing up to do, even though they have been around for quite a while. Uh, it's definitely a space to watch. Um, also, I think which is very interesting, which, um, you know, these technologies enable, uh, I kind of said this before, but anything can be transactable. So the value is in the moment. The value is not just money, but it's a re-emergence possibly of a barter economy where the actual value is determined by the systems underneath. What on earth is that going to mean for everybody? I mean, that's, that's a huge change, but nevertheless, I can see this happening. Um, and as in with Second Life, the whole idea of having distant transactions that actually occur locally, virtually, so I'm transacting with somebody just over there, but they're not actually there, they're actually somewhere else in the world, but it feels like a local transaction, is just one of those interesting sort of side effects, I suppose. So, you know, with, um, with these uh, new powers of augmentation and, and, and super powers, if you like, of technology, comes great responsibility. It's very important to understand the human in the equation. Now, I'm, I'm a computer scientist that kind of sort of went on to the dark side and got interested in cognitive science and things like that. People are complex, although from an you know, analytics point of view, they're reasonably predictable, but people are complex in the sense that you know, the designers and developers today, they don't have to just know how to cut code or draw well. They need to be able to understand psychology, cognitive science, anthropology, sociology, because more and more, it's not so much about the technology per se, it's about the human in that loop. And it's not enough just to make a, I don't know, a new kind of widget. It's actually more important to think about what are the implications of this, how are people going to work with it, how, uh, how does memory work in this situation, how are people going to be using this in a stressful environment, and so on. Um, and there's a term which I use quite often, but which I haven't really heard many other people talk about, and that is calm technology. The idea that we can actually design technologies to be, well, calming, as opposed to mobile phones today, which are possibly the opposite. Um, a state of technology maturity where a user's primary task is not computing, where computing augments and brings relevant information to the experience. Rather than focusing on computing and data, current computing places emphasis on people and tasks. That sounds like you know, everything you should think about, about usability. But current computing means more than that. It means you actually have to understand really how to convey information in a way that is not always in your face, it's not always alarms and things like that, using peripheral sensors and so on. And really the consequences of getting this wrong can be quite dire. So, uh, I mean, I can take absolutely no credit for that video, but I thought it was very appropriate for this particular conference. I, I know there's all the stuff in there about identity and things as well, which I thought was very pertinent at this time. You know, that's, if we don't think about it, that's probably where technology will end up going. Um, it's not a world that I necessarily want to live in, but, you know, augmentation is our future. Let's embrace it, but let's beware of where it could also go. So that's me. I think um, 